join. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is our second annual community outreach for uh, sponsored by the Mental Health Task Force. We're all part of the Cherry Hill community. So thanks for joining us. Um, we have a, a expert group of panelists this evening, and I am going to uh, give you their name and then they will introduce themselves. And uh, we will start with, uh, with Mo uh, Molly, and is Kelsey on Molly for ESS? I think they need to pull her over. <laughs> okay, all right, so then we'll go to Josh from Carasolis. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Joshua Hefner. I'm a customer success coordinator for Carasolis. Really excited to show you one of the resources we have at your disposal. I'm, I'm actually here for one of my colleagues, Tyler. And so when he asked me to join in, I was excited because I actually grew up in New Jersey. I'm from Atlanta County, um, grew up in Galloway Township, right next to Stockton College at the time, but now it's Stockton University. So hello, everybody. Thank you, Josh. Lauren. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Milner. I'm a social worker, and my role is clinical outreach specialist for Newport Healthcare which essentially means that I help people find the best treatment. And I'm really happy to be here and so excited to be a resource for you all. Thank you, Lauren. And then there's uh, Tammy DeLuca. Good evening, my name is Tammy DeLuca. I'm the public education officer for the Cherry Hill Fire Department. Um, and I have my, my boss is with me as well. Um, he'll speak in a second. Um, so I basically oversee all of our community education um, resources that we provide for the Cherry Hill Township. Thank you. And then I'll let Joe, Fire Marshal Joe, go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe. I uh, work for the fire department. I currently work in the fire marshal's office, and I work with Tammy. She's our uh, expert in many things in public education, as well as uh, juvenile, uh, juvenile uh, interventions. Thank you. And then we have the Greens, Harry and Reg Green. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harry Green. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist uh, with Assurance Behavioral Healthcare. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Gina Green, and I'm advanced practice nurse, um, psych mental health. And I also, um, funny enough, as Josh was mentioning, Stockton University. I'm also a professor at Stockton University. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Molly, I see that Kelsey's with us. I'm Kelsey McGarvey. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm with Effective School Solutions. And I'm Molly Concoli. I am in the Cherry Hill School District at the Alternative High School. I am the student assistance um, counselor as well as the guidance counselor there. I've been in the district for 17 years. Thank you, Molly. Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Redford from Penn Medicine Princeton House Behavioral Health. For the last 13 years, I've been the community representative for the uh, Cherry Hill, now Morristown facility, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you. And, and then Mayor, Mary Ann. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Ager. Um, I'm a psychiatrist here in Cherry Hill. I've been practicing here since 1988. Um, I've lived in Cherry Hill during that time, and my son went to the Cherry Hill school system. And I've worked with many parents and children, mostly with school issues during those years. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that I've done over the years, and also a few books that uh, my, my research group has written, which are available to you at the Cherry Hill Library as a free gift um, from our research group. So I'll tell you about that later. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, thank you everybody for the introductions. And now um, they all put together a slideshow, which is all of this is being recorded and the slideshow will also be posted on the district website for anybody that you know that couldn't make it this evening. And we will also let our families know that they can access it at any time. And this being recorded as well will be on YouTube um, as well as accessible through YouTube. So I'm going to share the screen of the um, of the slideshow. And then I will uh, move the slides along as our as our uh, speakers.
Okay. So I have to thank Jen DeMarco for Cherry Hill who helped with this beautiful uh, presentation for with me. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. One more minute. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? No. Okay, that's what I need to know. Hold on one minute. appreciate everyone's patience here. Now, of course, in my dress rehearsal, I went very, very smoothly. <laughs> Great. Sorry, folks. Mrs. Minjin, we can move over and present for you. Would you uh, mind we, doing that? Yeah, I'm no having problem. technical problems. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Mark, am I, will I be able to uh, move this along? Did you? Uh, you call for next slide, we'll move it forward. Okay, all right, we can go to the next slide. And I believe um, Fire Marshal, Joe, I'm not sure if Joe or Tammy's gonna present. I, I am. Great, thank you. All right, so thank you for having us again this evening. Um, so we provide uh, a various, a multitude of different resources through the fire department. Um, myself, I do uh, fire safety presentations that we're able to provide for uh, really pretty much any group um, throughout Cherry Hill Township. We um, do older adults, senior citizens, civic association groups, uh, religious groups, assisted living. Um, that's just one of the things. But basically, we talk about fire safety and uh, different things about how to get out of um, safely from a fire if there's um, in a building or anything like that or their home. Uh, we also do fire extinguisher training uh, throughout for businesses, schools, uh, public works personnel, our own personnel. Um, next slide. For the schools, which is obviously one of our biggest, uh, what do you call it? Um, audience there. Uh, we go out to every kindergarten class and that's both public and private schools. The firefighters actually go out and visit uh, all the kindergarten classes and they teach them fire safety. And then uh, the first, third and fifth grades, we provide a curriculum to the school district and the teachers are able to provide uh, fire safety for them. And then for seventh and eighth grade students, they are ta taught by myself. I go out to the uh, middle schools and able to speak to them. Uh, we also uh, do an operation prom for all three high schools, and that's every single year before prom season. Um, I also teach a program for the senior class 
on uh, college pre preparatory as well as, um, you know, as they go off to um, college, dorm fire safety and things like that. So you can go to the next slide. We provide a smoke alarm program for available to seniors throughout the township. Uh, we're able to provide three alarms per home, basically one on each level. Uh, we reinforce the need to check the smoke detectors monthly. Um, we also are able to, um, you know, even if we don't replace them, we're able to go out and check and give them any tips or anything like that. As well as um, carbon monoxide alarm, we try to reinforce, <laughs> sorry, my cat's here. <laughs> we try to reinforce um, everyone having carbon monoxide alarms in their homes. Uh, with carbon monoxide, you don't see it, taste or smell it, so you wouldn't know you have it. So we really try to make sure everyone, um, especially as we approach the winter season, um, we recommend one on each level. Um, okay, next slide there. And this is just a, um, a graph here that um, just, you know, basically tells you where you should have uh, smoke alarms and the carbon monoxide detector. I have a very pushy cat here. <laughs> Go ahead, next slide. Uh, we also do a neighborhood follow-up after a fire. So anytime there's a fire in the neighborhood, we're able to go and um, walk around the neighborhood. We'd usually do a two or three block radius where we knock on each and every door and we make sure um, that everyone has working smoke alarms and we'll go in and test them. And if they need them, we will replace them for them. Um, we also have a countywide program that we are able to provide for... <laughs> We able, we're able to provide, it's called Firewatch. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. I know um, the gentleman from, I forget what the name of it was now, but um, but anyway, we're able to provide that through countywide. It's um, for youth that are four to 18 years old that have um, had any involvement with fire, um, whether it be um, an interest in fire, or actually setting a fire, and we're able to provide them education. We do an assessment on them, um, comprised with their family as well as their um, is it their like um, parent or guardian. Sometimes we deal with the caseworkers, and then we're able to also provide uh, family and individual therapy for the students as well, or for the youth as well. Um, we also have the Vial of Life program that is um, for anyone in the um, township of Cherry Hill, we're able to provide, basically it looks like a medicine bottle. And we recommend, especially with older adults, if we're going out to the home and um, maybe they're not able to speak or if they're injured or something, it'll list um, a, their various medications and as if, they're, um, if they have any um, emergency contacts. So we're able to, you know, if they're not able to speak for themselves, they're able to have that information available to us. So, and that's something that we can provide from the firehouse, our administration office, we can drop them off or someone can pick them up as well. Okay, next. We also provide uh, several times a year, a babysitting class that is offered for youth that is 12 to 16 years old. Um, they also get certified in CPR and um, we are able to provide them basically CPR certification and then teaching them how to become a babysitter. We also teach fire extinguisher training to them. Um, and it, it's really been a very beneficial program. Um, so we'll be starting that up again in the spring. And then we also do a monthly car seat checkup event, which um, I'm one of the car seat technicians. So we're able to provide that um, every second Friday of every month at the Deer Park Fire Company located, located across from Beck Middle School. Okay, next, I think that was it. Um, all of the information I spoke about is on our website um, and it's under community risk reduction. And anyone, can, um, I'm there pretty much Monday through Friday. Um, you can always email me and um, I'd be able to, you know, come out and speak to any groups or anything like that um, or provide any assistance. And that is it. Thank you, Tammy. Mark, you can go to the next slide. So next we have Lauren to talk about Newport Healthcare. Hey everyone, thanks so much for spending your evening, your, your valuable time with us. And thank you so much to the Cherry Hill School District for uh, providing this, it's such an important resource. Um, so my name is Lauren Milner, I am a social worker. I have spent um, my career uh, for the past six and a half years just helping folks find treatment. Um, and what I always tell families is that um, you're not alone. You know, it's, we have a, a stigma crisis um, with mental health in our uh, culture. And so, so often families are struggling alone. So if there's one thing that I want 
you all to take home tonight is that you are not alone. Um, and that uh, the other thing that is so important to me um, in doing this work, like I've done for the, the past several years, is that I have had two family members need um, intensive treatment. And so any place or any person that I recommend to families, I would also send my own family members. I think that's really important. Um, so next slide. So I work um, for Newport Healthcare, which is the parent company to Newport Academy, which offers both outpatient and residential treatment for adolescents. And we also have Newport Institute, which offers outpatient and residential for um, young adults ages 18 to 28. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, and the other thing for our, our uh, local folks, so I'm, I also live locally and I um, want people to know that our closest outpatient program for adolescents is in Malvern, Pennsylvania. And our closest uh, residential program is Connecticut. We also have one in Virginia as well, but in Connecticut, it's a bit closer. Um, so in terms of our, our, our values and our mission, you know, every company has the value of, of excellence, right? Excellence uh, standards. But to me, what makes Newport really stand out is this idea of, of we will do whatever it takes and we will love our clients until they love themselves. So, so often we get um, clients that come to us feeling like really unworthy and really struggling with self-esteem and just feeling like undeserving of care and love and attention. And our motto is, again, we will love you until you love yourself. And that really, and they really follow that. You know, I've had the opportunity to be there, um, you know, personally, and it really is what makes it stand out to me. Um, next slide. So I included the mental health statistics, both um, in New Jersey and specifically Camden County. Um, as well as um, just in our country, because I think what's so important is that we, we know that there's a mental health crisis. And we also know that, as I mentioned before, there's a stigma crisis and there's an access to care crisis. So, you know, when I look at these statistics and I see like the rise of mental health, I, and then I see, you know, under mental health um, statistics in America, 59% of teens with depression receive no mental health services. And to me, that's so heartbreaking and it's nobody's fault, right? Again, it's, 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 we have this massive issue with stigma and access to care. And so oftentimes people go um, untreated. So I just thought it was really important to just kind of take a look at these statistics. Um, and what I, you know, what I tell families all the time um, What's so sad is that if, you know, God forbid your child was suffering with, um, a, you know, a diagnosis like cancer or diabetes, you know, we all rally together and people send flowers and cards and notes. And when someone's struggling with a mental health issue, so often we don't get that kind of support when we need it the most. Um, so next slide. So again, um, you know, in this slide is really illustrating that so often um, when someone is struggling, they end up in the emergency room, which thank goodness we have a, the emergency room that's there for a purpose. But then what happens is um, where do we go from there? Or is it possible to avoid, you know, emergency room visits? So this slide is really just, you know, illustrating like the increase um, in emergency room visits and related to mental health issues. And so my role is really to help both find a longer term plan and or preventing um, the emergency room visit. So I'm here as a resource to help folks access the best treatment. And whether that's an outpatient therapist, a psychiatrist, an outpatient program, a residential program, which I'm about to talk to <laughs> talk about more. Um, 
So next slide. And so how can we help? Um, and that's really what my role is. So um, my uh, it's a free service. Folks can call me and I will help them navigate the process of finding um, the best, most appropriate option for them. Um, next slide. So just a little bit more specifically about um, Newport is that our goal is really, we, we don't focus so much on the specific behaviors or you know, the, uh, the symptoms. We really see that as like a product of a, an underlying issue and whether that's trauma or you know, attachment ruptures, like we really look to treat like the underlying cause and not so much, you know, the really so much focusing on, on the symptoms. Um, next slide. And this is really like just like a model of our overall treatment. So, you know, the individualized treatment. So we see everybody as an, as, an, as a unique individual. And so their, their treatment approach is gonna um, be based on what their specific needs are. We have, you know, academic component. Of, we have like intensive family involvement, um, integrative treatment. And then of course, everything that we do, you know, evidence-based treatments as well. But I think what really makes us stand out is that we have experiential uh, therapy. Um, and just as an example of that, I, when I was there visiting, um, I was participating in, a, in group therapy. And the kids were really struggling with sharing, articulating their feelings. And so the counselor suggested, hey, you know what, let's take this group um, over to the basketball court instead. And we, we had the group therapy like while playing basketball, which you suddenly see all the dynamics and you see the kids come alive. And so I really think that is what um, just makes us stand out is really to be able to utilize the experiential therapies like the equine therapy and art therapy and adventure therapy, you know, really in an environment where kids thrive. I, I kind of think of our campus as like, almost like a, a, a beautiful camp with the clinical component. Um, next slide. And so again, this is really just, I, I look at this tree and I kind of think of like a, the, the family tree and, you know, the different components and then under, underlying it is really like, again, sort of that root, you know, what's going on, like the attachment ruptures. Um, we do offer uh, family therapy, a very intensive family program. Um, so again, like just really looking at what's, what's underlying these issues. Um, next slide. And so again, um, you know, this is my contact information. We are here, you know, we, this just kind of illustrates that, you know, we're all over the country um, here, here to help. And I think one last thing that I'll close with, um, you know, living in New Jersey and having had two family members need treatment. One of the things that I think is so hard is that locally, and we do have, we have great options locally, we don't really have residential options. So I think so often people think of the hospital or outpatient, and then there, there are these other really great long-term options that have a very loving, nurturing feel. So I just like to put that out there because I know it's just, it can be a little tricky being in New Jersey um, and trying to access care. But this is my phone number. Please don't hesitate to reach out or email me or text me or call me anytime I'm here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was really very, very informative. Thank you. Mark, if we could go to the next slide, please. All right, next up is our Effective School Solutions, which um, I'll let Kelsey and Molly um, take it from here. Hi, thank you, Bonnie. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm Kelsey McGarvey. I am one of the clinicians with Effective School Solutions. Um, so we are actually located at several of the schools in the district, including Bret Hart, Rosa Middle School, um, East and West, and then Alternative High School. And those are some of the therapists that um, work with Effective School Solutions that have been placed in the district. Next slide, please. Uh, so ESS, also called Effective School Solutions, or more commonly called as like the wraparound program, um, has been a leader in school mental health services. So 
they originally started as a private therapeutic day school for an out of district placement. Um, and kind of through the years of operating as that, they really started to look at the idea of bringing those same type of services to districts and having students remain in districts and not have to be bused or have districts pay a lot of money or really disrupt a child's you know, community and sense of belonging. Um, so they really looked at how to bring those types of therapeutic services to in-district. And that's where ESS came from. Uh, so next slide, please. So we've been in the Cherry Hill School District, I think at this point, like 12 or 13 years, it's been a very long time. Um, this is a full therapeutic service that we offer. It is at absolutely no cost to families. It does not go through your insurance. There's no co-pays. It is completely free therapy for your child. Um, as I stated, we're in several of the schools in the district. So we're in the Bret Hart School, uh, we're at Rosa Middle School, High School East, High School West, and the Alternative High School. Um, so at the Alternative High School, because that is a specialized program, that's where I'm located, all of our students have an IEP because that's part of the process of coming to Alternative, but you actually do not need an IEP uh, for ESS in the other schools. That's just anyone who needs services. Um, and any interest in ESS, and I'll go over kind of what we do and who we help and things like that. You reach out to either your child's guidance counselor or your CST worker if you've been assigned one. Thank you, next slide. Um, so essentially our program, it's a little bit different in each school, but overall every child that's in our program is assigned to a therapist and they receive weekly therapy with that therapist. So it is an individual therapy session. There are treatment goals. Um, and these are just some of the things that we work on. So anything related to like anxiety and depression, uh, poor anger management, any ongoing kind of conflict that's really disrupting their ability to function or be in relationships, oppositional behavior or really defiant behaviors, poor self-esteem, school refusal, school avoidance, substance use, um, poor impulse control, really any way that your child could be struggling that we would really see in a school setting, we're able to help and handle. Um, so like I said, every child in our program would get their weekly individual sessions. Uh, there's also a family component where we reach out to families and we work with families to really kind of partner and provide you the education and skills. Some of our children also receive daily group therapy um, and that would just be focusing on skill building, educating them on a lot of the discussions and the topics and the things that they need more support on and focusing on social skills. We also, for those that are um, avoiding school, so whether they're not going to class or they're staying home and not coming into school, we actually can start the um, assessment process and actually come out to your home and provide therapy, kind of like on a one-time basis each time, help your child get into school. Um, so any child that's really showing some school avoidance behaviors, we're able to kind of come out to the home directly, which is a really unique thing that really only ESS offers. And it's really successful in helping the kids come back into school. Um, and obviously we work a lot, you know, with behaviors and helping the school figure out, you know, how to really kind of reward those positive behaviors we see, how to try to limit um, some of the ones that we don't want to see. So we kind of are all over the place there. Next slide, please. Uh, so the results, so obviously we've been in the district for a long time. We've helped, I don't even know how many students at this point, um, you know, but we really do see an improved quality of care with our students, um, we see them going from kind of those crisis situations where they're consistently in the nurse's office or they're at home or they're in or out of partial or IOP programs to really being successful and doing well in a school setting. Um, we really, we kind of focus on three major things. Um, well, four, because mental health is, you know, the overall, but we really focus on academics, their attendance and discipline. So we really want to get them to a spot where they're just thriving in school. Um, and that the school understands them and the school can help them and they're really helping themselves. And by having our services in place, we've seen a reduction in classroom and school-wide uh, disruptions. I can't remember if I have another slide or not. Um, we can go to the next one if I don't have one, we'll just end. So basically, if you're interested in those services, those are the schools that it's offered in and you can reach out to your guidance counselor or CST to see about being referred to us. And again, it is a free program. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. So next we have uh, Mike, who 
who's going to speak about Penn Medicine. Thanks, Bonnie. And thanks again to the task force for putting this, this uh, opportunity together. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to speak to the Cherry Hill families that are, that are here tonight. Um, as I mentioned, I've been working with, with Princeton House for the past 13 years as a community representative, working with the schools, working with the hospitals, working with everyone in the community who is in need of, of finding a place for their patients who need a higher level of care. So um, as, you, as you can see on our logo, we're part, we became part of Penn Medicine um, in 2018. And uh, we are proud to be a part of that health system, that hospital system. Um, we have a facility, an outpatient facility in Moorestown. And uh, we uh, have been in, that, in, in, the Cherry Hill, in the Cherry Hill area for almost 20 years working very closely with the high schools and the middle schools and, and even the elementary schools. Uh, Princeton House is a, uh, one of the leaders of, of psychiatric and, and addictions treatment in, in New Jersey. And um, we're celebrating our 50th year of, of working in New Jersey with, to provide inpatient and outpatient treatment for adults and adolescents and children. Uh, but I'm here to talk to you tonight about our outpatient treatment for adolescents and children. Uh, in, when the, when the uh, pandemic hit in 2020, uh, Penn Medicine was very, very cautious and we pivoted to telehealth to provide our, our level of, of care, which is intensive outpatient. Um, we were providing everything in person prior to that and we felt that it was important to, for the safety of our staff, the safety of the, the patients to offer this level of care via uh, telehealth. And, and um, we've felt that that has been very successful in treating the people who've come to Princeton House for the last almost two years. Um, can you switch to the next slide? Um, this is just a, a graphic that shows that we are, where our outpatient sites are, and one of the things that's been great about switching to telehealth is that we've been able to work with people from some of the outlying counties that haven't been able to travel in to our physical sites previously. So with telehealth, we're running groups um, that include people from, from Southern Jersey as well as Northern Jersey. And um, it's really been, it's been great to, to provide access to more people. Next slide, please. Um, our IOP is, a, is, is, what we're, is intensive outpatient, which is really to help you understand what that is. It's the level of care that is higher than just in individual outpatient treatment. Um, many adolescents and, and adults will go see a therapist once a week. And Sometimes the therapist will recommend a higher level of care, meaning they, they need more than just once a week. And that's where IOP comes in. Um, we at Princeton House offer IOP to, as I mentioned, to adults and to adolescents and children. It runs three hours a day, three to four days a week. And um, our, our child psychiatric program is um, runs during the daytime hours. So that would be from, from 12.30 to 3.30, but our adolescent group runs from 3.30 to 6.30. So we felt that um, we wanted our adolescents who were coming to Princeton House to not miss more school. We felt that we would shift the IOP to an after school time frame, and that's been working out very well. Next, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we, we work with, with children ages 6 to 12 who are experiencing um, depression or anxiety or school refusals, a lot of the same things that Kelsey mentioned from Effective School Solutions. Um, one of the things that, that um, differentiates us is that, is that we are providing daily treatment for these, for these children um, with psychiatrists and nursing staff. It's an interdisciplinary approach. So they're, they're meeting with psychiatrists, they're meeting with the nursing staff, they're meeting with the social workers. And it's uh, the group process, it has 
um, gives these kids a chance to understand a little bit more what's happening to them and ways to improve their self-esteem, ways to function in a, in a more healthy way at home and at school. The same goes to, is the same with our adolescent programming, um, ages 13 to 18. We have different tracks. We have a psychiatric program. Um, those are for, for our adolescents who are, again, experiencing um, suicidal thoughts, some who are uh, doing cutting themselves, superficial cutting. Um, we have kids with anxiety, uh, kids who have ADHD, a lot of different things that are where an intervention is needed to stabilize these, these adolescents so they can get back to school and, and kind of normalize their family lives. Um, we also work with kids who are um, experiencing addiction issues. So co that's what the co-occurring disorders has to do with psychiatric as well as addiction issues. The last track that we offer for adolescents is, is a DBT, which is a dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a modality of treatment um, often reserved for people who have been resistant to treatment in the past. Um, very skill-based, very um, much where they're learning some specific um, didactic kind of one-on-one -on -one ways to, to help them understand what's happening to them and to address their, their symptoms. And um, it's, it's a very specialized track and we've seen a lot of success with, the, with the, uh, the ZBT track. Um, one of the things that is, that is great about Princeton House is that we offer the uh, additional, besides the therapy groups, we have a music therapy group, we have an art therapy group. So, they're experiencing, they're learning more about what's happening to them via um, other modalities of, you know, with art and, and singing, and, and it's, it's really been very effective. Um, as the, the kids are with us for about six to eight weeks at this, at this IOP level, and uh, we communicate with the schools upon discharging the students to reintegrate them back into the school day. So that the, the school knows that they're coming back, that they are, um, that they're coming back with, with new skills. And we've seen a lot of success with, with how the students are reintegrating into the schools with, with new abilities to um, control what's happening to them and to um, have a better sense of, of, of how to, uh, to interact with, with their, own, their own emotions. We do accept all insurances um, as well as Medicaid and that should never really be a problem. So that's, that's a, if, you know, it is a, it is a, it's a medical program. So we, we are, we do accept insurances. Um, one of the things I'd like to just mention at the end of this, is that we, uh, we do take a, a survey with, with every patient that comes into Princeton House. We uh, get a sense of what it was that they liked, what didn't they like, and we, um, we com compile all this information. We share this with the, with the staff at, at staff meetings. Um, I, as I was preparing this, this, this uh, pr presentation, I just pulled out a random, piece of uh, information that or a, a response that an adolescent had given about what did they like the most. And I thought this was a, this was a great response. He said, the balance between learning and feeling understood by the group was great. Um, knowing that there were like-minded um, students that are experienced experience patients with you in the group and having the opportunity to learn and develop skills with the patients was paramount to my treatment. Um, I thought it was impressive that an adolescent said paramount, but I, th I thought it was great. <laughs> Um, they do, in these group settings, really learn a lot, not only from the therapists, but from the other, the other patients who are in treatment with them. So um, again, we, uh, we work very closely with all, many of the, of the people who are here tonight, this is different organizations, Effective School Solutions, with Newport Academy, with many of the treatment providers that are here tonight. So we're, I'm happy to... Um, to always be a resource to you. If you have more, if you'd like more information, our, our website is princetonhouse.org. 
you can look look at uh, our website and, and learn a little bit more about um, how to access treatment. Um, but you can always, I'll put my information in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mark, the next slide. Okay, next we have uh, the doctor and Dr. Green to talk about assurance behavioral health care. Yeah, how are you? Um, uh, good night, everyone. I, I, excited to uh, talk about assurance behavioral health care. Um, so we're an outpatient uh, based facility in Cherry Hill. But my wife and I are both um, Cherry Hill residents and, and um, uh, I've been through the Cherry Hill school system. So we're, we're definitely uh, part of the Cherry Hill community. Um, next slide, not that there was much on the first one. Um, so in terms of approach, we just um, believe that through a variety of mechanisms, we, we do individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy uh, with um, adults, adolescents, and children, and that uh, we help people find uh, greater peace uh, and happiness. I, I, by training, am a clinical and forensic psychologist, and in some ways, the practice sort of follows those two tracks. One thing that's unique about us is, in addition to uh, sort of treating mood and anxiety disorders, um, bereavement, and, and, and some of those things that I think are on one of the slides. We also do a fair amount of psychological testing, including testing and intervention services uh, for the legal community. So I'll talk some uh, about that. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that has occurred, I'm sure uh, people have seen and has been talked about in this presentation by um, other folks is the pandemic has really, uh, A, I think, increased demand for psychological services. A lot of folks are hurting out there, and I think that uh, my wife, Regina, will talk ab about um, some of that in, in a moment. But, you know, the demand, I think many of us would, would say from our own lives, it's been, um, there have been all sorts of uh, stressors, new challenges that we've had um, to, to cope with. But one of the things I think that has come out that has really uh, improved access to care has been telehealth and at uh, Assurance Behavioral Health Care. We've really embraced that. So, you know, currently um, probably 70% of uh, our treatment services have been online based on um, what clients prefer. And then, you know, the office is still open for people who wanna come in um, uh, to the office and actually meet with someone when it was uh, warmer. Some people actually met outside uh, just as a safety precaution and inside, obviously we follow all the, um, the appropriate guidelines. Um, next slide. So, you know, it's an outpatient uh, mental health facility, as I mentioned. So some of these, uh, if you look at them, anxiety, depression, bereavement, trauma, marital discord, school underachievement, anger management, the, those are all uh, issues that uh, as human beings we face. But then by the time that you end up uh, receiving services for them, they're usually of severity that is uh, greater than uh, normal or uh, just chronicity. It's one thing to feel to feel uh, anxious or to feel down, but to feel so anxious or down that you can't go to work or can't function and or it's of such long standing that you kind of can't um, uh, shake it. That's when uh, finding uh, professionals to kind of help you through that. Uh, comes into play. And one of the things I figure since I have a, a captive audience here that I, I would like to address, I often get, you know, folks will say, oh, I'm, I need a, a therapist. And, you know, they receive a name and, and they sort of go with it and, it and it works or doesn't work. But I think that one of the most important things, and I think research backs this up, one of the most important things in a therapeutic relationship is the relationship um, that is had between the therapist and the, uh, the client, that that is one of the most important things. Uh, you know, some would argue more important than even level of experience or training of the, of the therapist. And the reason I say that is part of how um, ABH has grown to its size. We have over 10 um, licensed uh, psychologists and social workers and um, licensed professional counselors is because kind of back in the day when I was uh, one of the few therapists there, you know, there were some people that uh, my approach or someone else's approach didn't work well with them. Um, and that it sort of expanded to meet 
to meet those different needs. So I would just incur, uh, encourage anyone uh, who is uh, seeking out uh, mental health services for themselves or for their family or, or for their loved one is to you know, have a conversation uh, with that prospective uh, therapist or treatment provider to make sure that there's a good fit and to make that goodness of fit something that gets talked about on a regular basis because it's one of the most important uh, factors. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe not next slide. I'm gonna kick it over to my wife who has some uh, perspective on some of the things I think that um, adolescents in particular have uh, dealt with uh, in the times of COVID. So good evening, everybody. And I just wanted to sort of um, echo uh, the comments by Mike that, you know, we appreciate um, Bonnie and her team um, as always in the mental health task force for putting this together because I think it's it's really important, particularly during this time and, and over you know the last 18 months, almost two years of, of COVID sort of impacting our community and you know uh, across the country. Um, so uh, similar to what you know Harry just mentioned in terms of you know, recognizing the need for supports and, and how much things have changed. And, um, you know, do we really fully know the impact of COVID and mental health? I mean, I think we have a good idea, um, but sort of what are we doing about it? And what could we be doing about it? And, and certainly recognizing that, um, you know, for some people, um, you know, how do they, you know, improve access to care, as, as Lauren was saying, and recognizing that for our child and adolescent population, that for a number of them, they are more comfortable that it is a safe place to be in the in their room, you know, getting on and, and, and talking to somebody um, via a camera or if, if it is appropriate in terms of level of care being in an inpatient setting. Um, you know, as I mentioned, outside of being a mental health professional, I'm also a, a college professor at Stockton. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, not only over the last few years, but certainly um, just even with this new semester, this that some students that are struggling, you know, with the transition back and and the, the change and sort of juggling things. And um, you know, certainly one of the things that I wrote down to mention and, and similar to what Lauren said is that, you know, the whole idea of letting them know, you know, you're not alone, you know, and, and how do we find a way to reduce stigma, you know, and, and part of that is increasing awareness, um, certainly something like this to talk about it, like what resources are available. Um, and always saying that, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And so how do we let people know what's available? Um, and maybe it's not that first time, right? Maybe like, you know, um, I'll tell the parents and, and those of you that are watching that are not, are not familiar with it, um, that you know, the counselors, they send out a questionnaire every year out to the students and families. And I would encourage you to, to fill them out and send them back. Um, you know, sometimes, and then even when the students you know, go to the pediatrician and they have to now fill out the depression inventory, they don't always you know, fill it out to the extent that they're really focusing on the questions and, and how they're responding, but, but sometimes they do. And being able to get that one student, that one family, you know, engaging them um, and, and finding resources to support them is important. You know, we, we talk about resilience a lot, right? Like how full is somebody's cup and, and how um, able are they to bounce back to life stressors? Um, certainly COVID has taught us um, the need to provide additional supports, but, but sometimes doing that daily check-in, you know, like with my students, um, you know, I teach psych, I teach ethics, but in the psych class, I do a daily check-in with them and, and I tell them, you know, you're not alone and, and always like starting off class for the first five minutes, just a sort of a, a way to sort of decompress and, and have a conversation about it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we recognize that we know it's impacted us, right? Um, we know it's impacted our children and, and, and our, you know, within the community, but, but sometimes we think we know and, and, you know, it's sort of listening to your children and, and if they're not talking, doing that daily check-in. Hey, how are you doing? I know I had a tough day, but, but how are things going for you? And sort of opening that door so that maybe it might not be today, but, but maybe next week there's an opportunity there. Um, you know, I think beyond that, like I said, I think that the educators, um, the, then the school nurses, the counselors, um, Bonnie and then the rest of her team have, have done a really good job of, of being that first line for our children. And so, you know, we, we welcome this opportunity to talk with our colleagues and peers, because I think that there's a lot of resources that folks don't recognize or in the community and, and beyond. Um, you know, the last thing I wanted to say is I know, and I know that probably Marianne will talk about this too, is we talk about you know, what are some of the things that we can do um, to, you know, utilize and encourage strategies to build resilience in our children. And, you know, some of the things we talk about is, you know, identifying our feelings and emotions, right? That, all feelings are important and label them. When, when your child comes home and they're sad, they're angry, or they, they feel left out, or the social distancing has, has impacted them, 
um, you know, embracing the stakes, you know, both ours and, and, and theirs, um, modeling resiliency. How do you decompress and bounce back to life stressors when, you know, transitioning back to work or transitioning back to school or your peer group looks a little different or, or hey, you just went from being a senior in high school and now you're in a college setting or, or whatever that looks like. And finally, you know, exercising, right? Staying active, staying engaged. Um, we know that staying active strengthens the brain. Um, it increases resilience to stress and, and um, ongoing adversity. So, um, so again, certainly as, as some of the others said before us, um, we always welcome, you know, if someone wants to reach out, um, we, we definitely, you know, not only see people at ABH, but we refer out when we, someone else can provide a higher level of care. Um, and even, you know, just reaching out to find out additional information or resources for them. So again, um, leaving you with the message that you're not alone, we're, we're all in this together, um, and certainly glad to be there for anybody and, and answer any questions um, that anybody might have. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. So Mark, our next slide I believe is Care Solis. And our awesome. Hello everybody. Um, yep, um, my name is Joshua Hefner and again, I'm with Care Solis and I'm gonna go ahead and just give a background of our organization and then I'll ask to share my screen and show you a tool you all can utilize at home um, to get connected with some providers. Um, so if we can go to next slide, please. So CARES is a mental health care coordination service on a mission to calm the chaos of mental health. And so currently we're partnered with over 4,000 schools across the country and we provide access to over 3 million students, but our services are not limited to just the students. So student families as well as staff and staff families can utilize our services throughout the district as well. Next slide, please. And given the theme of mental health today, I'm sure we've all experienced that trying to get connected with the provider can be extremely chaotic, whether it's trying to navigate insurance, social stigma, which is mentioned earlier, and even language barriers. And I'm sure a few of us have come across find that provider, but there's capacity issues and wait lists. And so our goal is to really handhold families through this process so that the person who needs help can appropriately get provided, excuse me, get connected with a provider willing to help. Next slide, please. And the way we do that is through our three pathways of care. And so you're going to see in the middle at the heart and soul of that are our care companions. This is a 24-7 team of experts and navigating the mental health care system. And so when you get connected with a care companion, they're going to call providers on your behalf. So they're going to wait on hold, verify your insurance and the provider accepting your insurance and then trying to get the soonest appointment time based on your family's needs. And so the two ways to get connected with the care companions, on the left, you see a care loop, and that's a dashboard that the mental health staff throughout the district can utilize for the care companions to call you directly. But what I'm gonna focus on is on the left, that care match website. This is an anonymous and confidential resource you all can utilize. And so if I may now, um, if I'm able to share my, I will go to that website and quickly walk through that process. Thank you so much. So when you go to that, what we call Care Match website, there is a proprietary specific for the Cherry Hill District. And so you'll see here at the top, you, if you go to caresolace.com forward slash CHPSD, you can also select a different language if, if you need this in a different language. So from there, and then what I'm gonna do is then walk through these 10 steps here. This is like the Airbnb of mental health when it comes to this website. Again, it's anonymous and confidential. And so you can choose between any substance use disorders one is going through or any mental health issues. I'll go with, let's say I'm dealing with bipolar disorder and depression. it will ask for severity and I'll say my severity is medium. Then has this person seen a therapist before? I'm gonna say no. And then of course, outline any gender or non-binary. And then the age, again, we're here for families as well, including the students. And so whether it's a family, a grandparent, um, in this case, I'll do a student, or you can go ahead and move forward based on their age, as well as ethnicity.
And then we are able to work with anyone and find providers that accept any insurances, including Medicaid. However, if there are families without any insurance, we're going to look for providers that accept sliding scale and free options on your behalf. And then we'll enter the zip code. I'm going to put my old New Jersey zip code here for 08205 down in South Jersey. Um, and then you can outline how far you're willing to travel in order to get connected with those providers. And I'll stick with that 15 miles. You can now learn who's this for. Again, it's for that student. And then as our system generates based on that criteria I put in, there's going to be a list of providers that you can call based on what you are looking for. However, you see this pop-up window here. Our care campaigns are available 24 seven, whether it's phone, video chat, or email. And so if you give them reference code, see the list that you're just about to see and they will call those providers on your behalf. So you're not waiting on hold and it saves you a lot of time and they'll get back to you with the soonest appointment times based on your needs. And so then as I scroll to the bottom, you're gonna see here as I grew up in Galloway Township, you're gonna see all the different providers that deal with bipolar or depression. But if you need to adjust this as well, you can have special requests in here and adjust what you're looking for. And again, you can use our care campaigns at any time as well. But thank you, everybody. That is my short presentation. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Um, Mark, I think that's the end of the slides, correct? I believe so. Okay, great. Thank you. So we want to open it up uh, to see if anyone has any questions from our attendees. We'll be happy, our panelists will be happy to um, if, answer them if you have very specific questions. Oh, Mary, Mary Ann just popped up. Mary Ann, I apologize. Mary Ann uh, was part of our panelists last year and she's part of our mental health task force. She's a, a uh, viable and wealth of knowledge in her experience and years of, of being a Cherry Hill resident as well as her, her, her profession. Um, she, she had, we had some uh, extenuating circumstances. She was able to join us at last minute so we didn't wanna uh, leave her out. So I'm gonna let her talk. She doesn't have any slides, but I'm gonna let her talk about what she does as, a, as her profession, how she supports the Cherry Hill community. Marianne. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think I've mentioned before, I'm in private practice as a psychiatrist here in the area. And but what I wanted to talk about tonight is research that I do with the research team. We do what's called ethnographic research. This is um, something that's um, been popularized, especially at the University of Pennsylvania. It's research in which you collect information directly from um, people in your study. And it's a very open-ended kind of thing. So. What I do with children, and I've been doing this for about 30 years, is my research group takes a sheet of paper like this. I don't know if you can see, but it says at the top, we give this to children all over the, all over the country in schools, and we ask them to draw a picture or write a story. How can I help myself learn? Um, we also do, how can my parents help me learn and how can my teachers help me learn? And after we collect thousands of these, we sort them by grade um, and by um, sometimes a learning disability. For instance, we might take students that have ADHD and look at all of theirs separately, or students that have um, a cognitive disorder separately. And what we do once we, we do that is we sort them out and we find the common thread of the things that kids are able to tell us they really need to learn. And we take that and we publish it in small books for children. And I have a couple samples here. This one is called, How Do I Feel About Learning? This was a book we did of children from grades one to six. And each uh, section in here for each grade is actually collected thousands of responses by children at those grade levels. And you will actually see their cute drawings and their stories about how they explain exactly what will help them learn. And a typical thing is like a little first grader might say, 
well, if I love my teacher, it'll help me learn, okay? Now, the sixth graders certainly don't say that. The sixth graders are much more into, you know, if my peers dig the class, I dig it too, or something like that. So you can see developmentally in here, if you look at first grade, second grade, third grade, on up to sixth grade, how different each, uh, each age group is because um, they have different concerns about their learning. Another book that I have here is, this is a book we did, it's called A to Z, and it is an A to Z format. And this is a book for home, for parents. Um, if you have a child who has a learning problem, that's who we surveyed for this, but the secret is that these books work for everybody because if you can help one child, you help many. And each thing is, does have an alphabet letter and you, go, you can go through and get little hints of things that you can do at home to help your elementary school student. And these all come from children and then their parents who we surveyed. So these two books right now um, um, are at the Cherry Hill Library in the community resource section. And anybody who would like to get them can go to the library and um, get extra copies of these and take them home and use them um, to see if they're at help to your children in learning. Each book has in the back an area where you put notes or a checklist. So that reinforces what the kids learn in these books. So I'd like you to give them a try. They're um, free from our research group. And um, if, you, if you have problems getting them, you can always call my office or email me. And if you and your kids would like to create a, one of those sheets and answer our question, um, you know, how can we help you learn? How can your teacher help you learn? How can your parents help you learn? Feel free and send it back to us. It'll be part of our collection. We'd appreciate your input. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Marianne. That was very, mm -hmm. that was very informative, very helpful. Thank you. So now we will open it up to our attendees. If they have any questions, um, you can raise your hand and then we can call on you. Um, we will give it a few minutes to see if anyone has anything for our panelists. Oh, I see a hand. Mark, do you want me to take care of it? You will, you, you want to do it? Okay. We'll take care of it. Okay, thanks. Stephanie, looks like you have your hand up. Stephanie, did you have a question? I don't know if there's a bad connection. Yeah, I, I'm, unfortunately we can't, Mark, can they type their question or we don't, they don't have the capability. We'll open that up one moment. Okay. Stephanie, if you would like to type your question because you're come, you're not, it's not clear on your question. You want to uh, open it, type it in the chat. We'll be able to read your question. All right, so she, yes, yeah, Stephanie, we, we couldn't hear you, correct. that's correct. Can you type your question in? We'll be happy to answer it if you have a question. Okay, her question is for you, Lauren. I don't know if you could see it. She says Newport Academy is close to location as Malvern. Is that correct? And if so, they can't see patients in New Jersey. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that that is correct. So the closest um, program is our outpatient program, which is in Malvern, Pennsylvania. And um, so they can see kids from New Jersey, but not in New Jersey. So and, and it's not virtual. So um, our, our program is so interactive and we have an academic component, all of that. So um, and I do have I know it's I know it's a haul. It's about an hour, but I do have folks drive from this area to um, to Malvern when that's um, appropriate. And then our closest residential, we have one in um, Connecticut and one in Virginia. So if that answers the question, feel free to reach out directly if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for answering that. Are there any other questions or Stephanie, if you had any other follow-up questions, you can just type it in there. Okay, I see Kristen. Uh, Mark, do you see Kristen has a question? Hi there, thanks to everyone for doing this panel tonight. Um, Lauren put up in her slides some information on the 2021 report by the New Jersey Department of Children and Families. I just wondered if anyone has any data specifically from COVID about kids 18 and under and, and what mental health looks like for, for those children. Um, I was actually looking today like on the NJDOE's website and couldn't really find anything specific to the last 20-ish months. Um, that's all, thank you. I could tell you to check the New Jersey Psychiatric Society. I believe that they have statistics. I know that they're updating them as quickly as they can, but um, they do have a pretty good network. Um, I don't know how recent it'll be, but I know that as of three months ago, they had some kind of tally of what was going on in the state that they surveyed. So it's New Jersey Psychiatric Association. Thank online. you. I'll, I'll look there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, are you able to see the question in the chat from Stephanie? Yes. Okay. I was typing it out, but then I'll just say it. Um, so yeah, so we do have a school-based psychiatrist, Dr. Hewitt. He is amazing. Um, he does work specifically with effective school solutions in this school. So any student on our caseload that would require med management, um, he actually can take on his caseload. So that's actually a really great feature because typically there tends to be a huge wait list for um, outpatient psychiatrists. He only through the school component can see children that are in the wraparound program, the ESS program. He does have an office in the community so you could access him that way. But yes, to have him work with your child through the school, your child would have to be a member of the ESS community. And again, if you're interested in talking to um, any of them about referring your child, you would go through a CST worker or guidance counselor, and they would help you with the appropriate referrals. Hopefully that answers that, Stephanie. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other? OK. Stephanie has a question. Last question, she says, is generally for most parents trying to get outpatient services on a non-intensive basis, we are seeing about two to three month wait list. Is, there, is that what you are seeing? So this is for the panelists as far as a wait list to get it for outpatient services. Uh, so I'll weigh in. There certainly have been some wait lists, but we have some availability. I mean, it's it's been... Um, uh, you know, for whatever parent uh, asked that, I, I'll give you my personal cell phone number. It's 856-905-3732. Give me a call or text me, um, and I'll definitely, uh, if, if you were asking for uh, someone uh, specifically. But yeah, are there wait lists? Certainly there are. Um, in our practice, we have uh, some clinicians who do have some availability. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I don't see any other hands raised and I... Okay. 
Okay, Joe has a question. Um, this looks like it's all ESS. Um, <laughs> so I'll go through each question. If it's not me, then I'll pass it off to the appropriate one. Uh, so the first question, is the ESS program a free program within the school or a private organization working within the school system? Um, so ESS is its own company. We are a nonprofit company. Um, and essentially we partnered with the district. So the district, um, the district or ESS, someone reached out to somebody and they agreed to enter the partnership. So the district actually does cover the cost of our services. So it is completely free to families. It does not go through insurance, um, but there is, you know, a contract with the school district. They are the ones in charge of that. Uh, so does the second one is if private to provide the normal insurance. Again, you don't go through insurance with ESS. Um, so that's often for a lot of our families a relief. They don't have to worry about, you know, prior authorizations or if you accept my insurance. It's just you get referred to our program, we complete an assessment, and we put you in our programs. Uh, the third question was, does HIPAA confidentiality apply to any services given within the school at ESS or directly shared with the Cherry Hill Public School? That is actually a really great question, um, and that's definitely a concern that a lot of our families have. We operate the same way that any other treatment facility would operate, which is that the confidentiality standard. So the times that we break confidentiality is the same thing that we would see in an outpatient or like an IOP or partial program. If the child is at risk, so if they are reporting like really intense symptoms and we have a concern about their safety, we have to let the appropriate people know. Um, if they're reporting to us that they are being harmed by somebody, we have to let the appropriate people know. Um, if they have plans to really harm somebody, we have to let the appropriate people know. In terms of what's shared with the school, we operate still as a very confidential program. Um, we share what is needed to share with the school. So for example, if I'm working with a student who is having a lot of school refusal and school avoidance behaviors, during a meeting with like CST guidance and the appropriate school supports, it wouldn't just be like anyone random. I might talk about what are some of the really known things that are really making it challenging for that student. Um, we operate very much on a share less is more. We never want to break confidentiality with students. We want them to feel that they are supported. Um, so it is still very similar to the outpatient programs where we abide by confidentiality and we actually are bound by things like duty to warn. You know, we can't just share things. Um, do you encourage school? This is question number four. Do you encourage school guidance counselors to Advise on the program and outreach parents and students as I've seen it very lacking for recent years and more of a pushback, not recognizing mental awareness and mental behavioral issues in students, especially by teachers and other school professionals, which makes me request to evaluate the staff in our schools. Um, so I think what the question is asking is if we provide some kind of um, education towards staff. And I would say, yes, we do. I know at Alternative High School, we are involved in every single staff meeting. Um, we attend in service days. We often, either myself, my co-coalition, or someone from my company will present on different mental health topics. Um, so it's definitely the schools that have it, they have the opportunity to receive ongoing education and support from ESS, especially about like mental health trends, um, you know, what that might look like in the classroom, how to better support students and teachers. Um, so that is something that we do take very seriously and we view that as part of our duty of being a mental health provider is to really kind of help educate. Because if we only work with the student, we're not going to see any change. It has to be kind of everyone's working together from the family to the school to the provider to the student. So hopefully that answered that one. If that was not what you were asking. Kelsey, I can definitely I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that. That yeah. question. Um, just so you know, our, our, the mental health task force um, is made up of, besides the professional panelists that were here tonight, um, uh, all our schools are representative either by teachers, um, guidance counselors, and our SACs, all our SACs from middle school and high school are on the uh, task force. Uh, so they come to all our meetings. They are, they know about our resources the panelists that we're here tonight, as well as all multiple other resources that are out there that they do refer. Um, and we are with Care Solace 
uh, being on board this year. Now our, we're able to support our staff as well as our students if they are in need of any kind of, uh, of any kind of resources, whether it's a drug addiction, mental health, um, learning how to meditate, uh, mindfulness, everything that, that it's needed. So uh, we're not only taking care of our students, but our staff and our mental health task force are all representative of, the, of Cherry Hill. So uh, they are able to um, provide support and maybe answers and guide students on, on mental health um, as we're, we have been really focusing since COVID even more so on making sure that we have enough support in place for our students and our teachers um, by this group, as well as everybody else working as a team, child study team, nurses, counselors, and SACs. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers the question also. So, and as, as well, um, as Stephanie has also commented that, yes, so um, ESS is in the alternative high school. They've been there um, since probably around 2009, um, their services started in the district. It is um, part of our DES program, the Alternative High School, that is, that is true. Um, students at Bret Hart, Rosa, and the Alternative High School, I do believe it needs to be written into your IEP, um, or um, if a student is in the school system um, with the IEP in the behavioral emotional support programs, um, a guidance counselor or a staff member can refer to the case manager who then um, can write it, you know, have an IEP meeting and decide whether the services are appropriate. Um, East and West do run a little bit differently because they are a larger population. You do not need to have an IEP to be in the program in East, at East and West. Um, and they do take in students that have anxiety and depression. However, there is a large population at East and West and there are only one or two counselors respectively at the high schools, which means that their caseloads are a lot smaller. It's a little more disproportionate. Um, here at the Alternative High School, I mean, we have 36 students on our roster and Ms. Kelsey and Ms. Katie have 28 of our students. So it's a little bit different when it runs through a behavioral emotional support program um, compared to the way it runs with the comprehensive high schools of East and West. So um, yes, there is a triage of severity when it comes to high school East and West. Um, let's see. Thank you, Molly. Molly, I think there's another question yeah. that, um, so our care soloist now is providing uh, our teachers with support for mental health. Um, and we also are um, in the works, it's not finalized yet, of some other uh, strategies for our teachers that actually we'll be meeting on tomorrow. Our group mental health task force is meeting tomorrow morning. Um, something that we'll, we are working on with the University of Penn um, that we're gonna be talking about and hopefully we'll be able to launch that for more, more supports for our teachers um, and staff. Um, but that has not many, been finalized yet. Many of the schools have taken on the initiative um, of professional development, of being trauma-informed schools, of working through the trauma-informed lens. It is a big part of our um, daily work at the Alternative High School. Um, I know that Beck has really launched um, into a lot of professional development on trauma-informed schools. It is something that is um, across the board in the district being discussed and it, it is um, professional development that's being provided to the staff members. Um, we are also, there are um, guidance counselors and uh, student assistance counselors across the district who are participating in a 33-week course um, through Thrive uh, to become mental health uh, certified specialists within the district. So the district really has launched a huge initiative in providing um, more staff for more support for our staff as well as our students. 
Thank you, Molly. That's correct. Um, let me see. I don't see any other questions in the chat or any other hands raised. Um, and if if uh, the attendees, if there's other questions or as uh, people may ask you, how was it? They can also always reach out. Um, I'm on the district website um, and I have connections to everybody that was here tonight. Um, I can certainly always just uh, get you um, connected or answer any of your questions. We're, or, we're always here for you. So I wanna thank everybody um, for joining us, the panelists, as well as the attendees for, for coming on. Um, and uh, I appreciate your time and I hope everyone has a, a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Take care. Everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.